of Jesus today. Y'all sing it out. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of Eben Lazarus. Your voice is calling. The truth is we are not because Jesus never loses a battle. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, fellowship. Welcome 
to those of you who are worshiping with us here in the building and those of you who are worshiping online, we are so pleased that you chose to join us this morning. We're excited that this Sunday as a family service is a week that we can live out our passion of being an intergenerational church where those from our youngest to our oldest can come together to become more like Jesus so that everyone everywhere experiences Jesus. It's truly a gift and we're so glad that you are part of it this morning. We're also super excited that this morning we will be celebrating baptisms. And I don't use the word celebrate lightly. It is truly what we are doing. We are celebrating the fact that these individuals are going to make a public public proclamation of what Jesus has done in their heart. And I pray as you watch them that you will remember the good work that he did in your heart and that we can all be reminded of what it's like to be loved by a God that died on the cross and rose from the grave for us. So let's truly celebrate these baptisms together. Hi, my name is Amanda. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior on Christmas Day 2011 at Trinity Chapel in Powder Springs. I was in my senior year of college and carrying around the weight of a lot of different things on my shoulders. I didn't grow up knowing Jesus very well, and so the way that I learned to operate in life was largely in my own strength. I was feeling pretty worn out, and the message that I received that day was very much one of hope and restoration. Since that day, I've become a wife and a mother, and God and I have been on this incredible journey of revelation, growth, and a lot of trust building. I wanted to have a better understanding of the significance and meaning behind baptism, but I also think on some level I wasn't quite ready to completely close the door on all that I once knew in order to fully walk in faith. He's been very patient with me and my baby steps, but I recently felt that stirring inside that it's time and I'm ready. I'm ready to be all in and I'm ready to lay some things down once and for all and I'm pretty excited. Um, I want to be baptized today because I want to be sure that I'm modeling what it looks like to be a follower of God's Word for my own daughter and living it out in my own life for her to see. For us, baptism is so much more than just someone taking a bath or getting wet. It is literally acting out and rehearsing the gospel. Baptism is the time when we commemorate the work that Christ Jesus has done for us. And when someone like my dear sister Amanda comes to us and says, I need y'all to know what Christ has done in my heart and my faithful commitment to him today. And so my sister, is is it true that you have trusted in the finished work of Christ Jesus for the salvation of your sins? Yes, sir. And is it your desire to be faithful to the obedience toward Christian baptism today? Yes. Awesome. Well, then, my sister, it is my pleasure and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. (laughs) This way, this way. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Henry and I'm 14 years old. I've been going to Fellowship Bible Church since I was four months old. Nothing my God God cannot do do for you. For you. Where did you learn that? From church. When I was five years old, I told my mom that I wanted to become a Christian and we prayed the prayer of salvation. Since becoming a Christian, I wanted to become a better person. I want to get baptized today to show that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and that I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose three days later. God is so great. My, my God is so mighty. Him nothing nest, him you have, God is so good. Good morning, church. Glory be to God. My name is Curly Henry, and this is my daughter, Elizabeth Henry, who is here to proclaim her faith and be baptized. Uh, Earlier this week, my wife shared a verse uh, from Jesus' baptism, uh, from Matthew 3, 17, that said, this is my son 
uh, who I am well pleased. Lizzie, your mother and I are so pleased that you have chosen to continue your faith and your walk with Jesus Christ and pursue sanctification. And I am so thankful that your mother has poured so much into you to help you along with your journey. In church, my wife Ellen and I are, are so thankful for all of you that have prayed for Elizabeth, that have been mentors and teachers from, from his kids to fellowship kids, student ministry to mission trips. And we ask that you continue to pray and mentor her. As I read and prepared for this week, uh, Lizzie, uh, a verse that spoke to me was from Philippians 4.13, and it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I, I would be remiss if I didn't also share uh, a verse from one of your favorite passages from Matthew uh, 5.14 uh, that says, you are the light of the world. Uh, what's the rest of it? Uh, city set on a hill cannot be hidden. There we go. And now, because of your love of Jesus Christ and your obedience to his commands, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. I'm in seventh grade, and I've been at Fellowship Bible Church for three years. I also like soccer, just so everyone knows. I accepted Jesus as my Savior in the hospital. How I accepted him was I was not in the best shape during the hospital, and I needed Jesus to save me. I want him, to, everyone to know today that I want to get baptized so everyone knows and that I can have Jesus closer to my heart. My name is Emery Lott, and it is my honor to be here this morning with my daughter, Emmy Lott. Emmy, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. God's Word says that He knows the plans that He has for us, plans for hope and a future, and plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Emmy's gone through some tough things in life. In fact, just this morning, she was discharged from the hospital about an hour and a half ago, but she did not want to miss this this morning. She wanted to be here. So, Emmy, because of your faith and love in Jesus Christ, and because of your public acknowledgement of, of him as your Lord and Savior, it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi, my name's Collier. One of my interests are I like to play sports like football and basketball. I'm in sixth grade and um, I've came to accepting Jesus in a car ride with my mom since she picked me up early from school on a Friday afternoon and um, I learned and realized that Jesus is my savior and that he saved me from sins and keeps protecting me and watches over me and I feel like I want to get baptized today because I want not only me and my family to know that I've been that I accept Jesus into my heart, but also because I want everyone to know that I accept Jesus into my heart. And this is Collier. And Collier, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Because of your love and faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And because of your public acknowledgement of him as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My name is Carson. My interests are playing sports like football and basketball. I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was in kindergarten. I'm getting baptized today to let people know that I've accepted Jesus into my heart and to let people know he's my savior. Uh, 
and I'm still up here. I didn't want to leave. <laughs> We've had the just the amazing experience recently with our kids, a family of 10 with eight children, and we've just truly experienced kind of a revival with some of our kids lately, and it's, um, it's pretty exciting to be up here with three of them today. Carson, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Because of your love and faith in Jesus Christ, and because of your public acknowledgement of Him as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. continue celebrating that this morning. Y'all can stand on up. We're going to sing a song called Firm Foundation this morning, and I think it so perfectly ties in with what we've just seen of people placing their faith in Jesus. Let's just continue in that this morning to place our firm foundation in who he is. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations so why would he fail now? He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not. If our foundation is in Jesus, we stand secure, we stand firm. And I don't know what you walked in with this morning, I don't know what you might be carrying, but we have an opportunity to place our foundation in Jesus today. Let's respond. The rain came when blue, my house was built on you. I'm safe with
Jesus, thank you this morning that you do not fail. God, that no matter what we walk through, no matter what we face, we serve a God who does not fail. And we have a firm foundation. We have a place to put our hope and a place to put our trust that is secure. Jesus, we thank you for that truth this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Y'all can be seated and turn your attention to the screens. Good morning, Fellowship. It's been a great day so far. But before we go any further, I have a few quick announcements for you. Now, on the screen and the seat back in front of you, you're going to see a QR code. And if you're new to Fellowship and want to find out more about how to get connected, scan it now to be taken to our Today page. You can fill out an online Connect card and someone from our team will be in touch to answer any questions that you might have. Also on that Today page, you can find out more information or sign up for any of the events that I'm about to mention. Men, join us for our upcoming Bible study and overview of the entire New Testament. This is going to be on Wednesdays beginning May the 3rd at 6.30 p.m. This is part of a transformational discipleship initiative we're starting throughout our church to develop a shared sense of biblical fluency. That is, how to understand and use the Bible together. Whether you've been interacting with the scriptures for a long time or you're brand new to Jesus and the Bible, this study is a wonderful opportunity to have conversations with other men in our church about the Bible. Mother's Day is right around the corner, Sunday, May the 14th. We cannot wait to honor all of the moms and motherly figures in our lives at both services. We're going to have a special surprise gift for each mom, as well as photo opportunities for you and your families. You really won't want to miss it. So to stay up to date on these events and more, be sure to subscribe to E! News on our website and follow us on social media at Fellowship Roswell. You can also download our mobile app from the Apple App Store or Google Play. And if you'd like to partner with us in making a difference in our church, in this community, and the world, scan the QR code or visit our Today page to give online. You can also find boxes located at the back of our worship center and at each exit where you can place your gifts. Well, that's all I have for you now, and let's continue on with the rest of the service. Well, family, good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with y'all this morning. Shouts out to the families that are here. If you're under 10 in the room, would you make some noise? It's like six of y'all. That's all right. If you're in middle school, say, oh, yeah. And we got any high schoolers, give me a whoop whoop. Everyone else say good morning. Family, I am so excited to be here. There's a lot that's happening this morning, but one of which is we just got to witness several people rehearse the gospel right before our eyes. And y'all, I'm just gonna tell you, like baptisms are one of the most amazing things that we do here every single week. We get to, and it's not just going through the motions of baptism, but it's the sermon baptism preaches that each of us is dead trying to pass through the waters of God's judgment. But Christ Jesus, having been plunged beneath that flood for us, allows us to pass safely from death into life, being raised to newness of life. And every time somebody gets baptized, it's a reminder to the enemy that he's losing ground, that Christ Jesus wins. And this thing ain't got his name on it. It's got Jesus's <laughs> name on it. Amen. I'm so excited. I didn't even tell y'all welcome. Well, good morning. It's good to see y'all. Uh, we're having some technical issues, so if you're on with us on the live stream, thank you for being with us. And if you're not, we hope that you'll tune in on the recording. Um, I just want to say how much we love and care about you as a church. And this morning, we get to honor some really, really special people. Uh, this morning, we had a brunch and a breakfast for our servants, those who are serving here in our church. And it's just so fun to see all the different faces and ways in which people are serving. So here's the thing. If you're here and you're currently serving somewhere in our church, would you please stand and and stay and remain standing. Would you please stand? Let's give it up. Okay, stay standing, stay standing. Uh-uh, uh-uh, stand back up. I see you, thank you. Love your shirt, by the way. Hey, if you're around someone who's standing, I want you to give them a high five and say, thank you for serving.
I also want to shout out a special group of people who serve and you probably never see them and it's by design that you don't see them, but <clears throat> they are keeping us safe every Sunday. They've got eyes on the entire campus. That is our safety team. So shouts out to our safety team. Shouts out to those who are, yeah, give it up for them. And a big, 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 huge thank you to Roswell PD who keeps us safe every single week. Thank you all for your service. Thank you. Everyone who's in the parking lot, to holding a door, to carrying a baby, to making coffee, to serving in children's, to serving in students all across the board, we can't do any of this without you. And so for those of you who have given your life away in service of our church, this is our Sunday to say thank you. I'm just going to tell you, if you ain't had it yet, it's some dope monkey bread. It's a grits bar down there, fresh fruit. Uh, you can make your own parfait. And we've got a message from the leaders of our church for you. So please make plans to grab some food after service today. I want to um, invite you, if you take your copy of God's Word, to meet me in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. The Gospel of Mark chapter 10. As you turn there, every Sunday we get the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful privilege of praying for our brothers and sisters here in our city, around our nation, and around our world. And so this morning we get to pray uh, for our brother, Pastor Jeremy Morton at Woodstock First Baptist. Um, and we also get to play, pray for Claude Acho. Uh, who's at Resurrection Church in Charlottesville. A week from today, I will fly to Charlottesville to be present as our brother is ordained into the ACNA. It's a pretty monumental moment uh, for him and, uh, and really for us as they've launched in the last couple of weeks and God's already doing some really cool and special things through the Church of the Resurrection. Also, we're gonna be praying for Nick and Maya Mikuluk, our partners in the Ukraine. For those of you who are partnered with us financially, you got an email this week, or maybe you can open it this week, and I give you a bit of a financial update on where we are as a church. It's really encouraging. And I tell you a story that the Michalux that Maya shared with William Rainey when she was here in town last about where the special offering that we took up for them, how they use that money, and y'all, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal story. And it's just another way in which you can show and see that your dollars, what you give here, we're not just hoarding it to keep it to build us up. No, it's going across the world so that literally the church can be the light in the darkness. I encourage you, if you uh, haven't opened that email yet, go ahead and open it and, and be blessed and encouraged by that story. But before we hop into Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. I want to pray for us and for our brothers and sisters that we have before us this morning. So would you go with me before the Lord in prayer? Father, in your goodness, you've allowed us to gather here by your power under your strength. And it's good for us to be reminded that it is not us who invite you into a place for who can invite someone who owns everything, but rather you have invited us and we submit and humbly say yes and thank you. For our brothers and sisters before us, Lord, we know that you are the one who knows and numbers our days. You know the hairs on their head. You know where they are in this moment. I pray that your manifest presence would attend to them I pray that you would lift their countenance if they're discouraged. I pray that you would fill my brothers with strength as they stand and open the word and declare, thus saith the Lord. And I pray that the churches in which they serve would be filled with joy, that they would be filled with encouragement. And Father, that your gospel, which works in every place and space, in every zip code, that it would work this morning in and through your service. So Father, for us this morning, as we open your word, to hear what it is you would have for us to say, Spirit of God, you are the hand that penned the words on these pages. Would you be our God and our interpreter this morning? We love you so much. Let's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. When you get to Mark chapter 10, verse 35, give me a oh yeah. If you need a minute, say hold up, brother. Sounded like somebody said something, but I can't really tell, so I'm just going to sit here for a minute. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord. 
And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit in my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've spent the last three days watching the NFL draft. And I've been watching the various nature of celebrations inside of people's homes. It was interesting to watch and see who's there present in Kansas City on draft day. It's also interesting to see who's present in people's homes. In some of those homes, you've got a lot of people, fans, friends, loved ones that are there. And in some of those homes, you've got three or four people. You've got close family. And the question that I had while I'm watching the draft is, who makes the cut? Like, how do you determine who actually ends up showing up to be present at the draft class, because sometimes, like if I think I'm close to someone and I'm like, yo, I'm ready to come over, eat a chili, uh, chili cheese fries and a hamburger and a hot dog, and they're like, whoa, no, you can't come. Like I'm feeling a certain type of way about that. <laughs> it reminded me of draft day, draft night, 2009, when both my brother and I were waiting to hear our names called by NFL teams. My brother got a call and got drafted in the third round to the Tennessee Titans. I got a call from Cam Cameron, the OC from the Baltimore Ravens to tell me I was gonna be a Raven. And around us, we had family, we had friends, but there are some people who were there present with us that day who we don't even talk to anymore. There were people who liked the idea of being around greatness, those who liked the idea of being around those who were going to ascend but didn't have the disposition or even the desire to carry through even long after our careers have been over. I think about those who want to be great so they attach themselves to greatness. I'm thinking about the same people hugging these young men in these living rooms or the same folks who in five or six years may not even be in the picture. And it got me thinking about us. I think as humans, we are naturally attracted to excellence, to greatness. And we want to be close to it. We want to be around it. But sometimes we end up borrowing the glory of other people or using people so that we ourselves can be great. And in the kingdom of God, the pathway to greatness doesn't go through multiple people with high status, but it goes through one person. And in the kingdom of God, to arrive at greatness implies that you begin very lowly. That is not how James and John are approaching the idea and the concept of greatness. James and John are using a very worldly method to try to gain prominence, and what they're doing is incongruous to the kingdom of God. In short, what they're doing and what we see first here in the text, first point this morning, is self-interest disguised as worship and discipleship. What we get are two men who have a relationship with Jesus that's very special. They're in his inner circle. And these two men who have this really special relationship with Jesus are now seeking to use that relationship for their own personal gain. In order to illustrate this, I want to I show you a picture. Can y'all tell me who, who this is? 
Anybody know who this is? Of course we know who Jafar is. It got me thinking, I saw a picture, I saw a question this week that was, what was the first movie that you ever went to go see in a movie theater? Do y'all remember what the first movie you ever went to go see? Y'all can tell me, what was it? Little Mermaid, E.T.? What was it? Premature Burial, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? (laughs) What was it? Spider-Man, love it. Black Panther, what? What was it? Frozen, let's go. Let it go. So, so we've all got these memories. For me, the very first movie I ever saw was The Lion King, but I love the movie Aladdin. I love Aladdin, and here's Jafar. Jafar is the king's vizier, which means that he is the king's closest, most trusted advisor. And yet throughout the movie, the situational irony is that we know that he's more associated with the thing, the staff he's holding in his hand than he is with an honest man. And it's not until the end of the movie that the king realizes ultimately who this man is. But what Jafar does is he uses his position and the one who's over him to get what he wants, which is ultimately total domination. And thank God for that street rat that foils his plans. Jafar, in another way, and to use another phrase, is a fox in a hen house. James and John, in some ways, represent a similar idea. They want greatness and glory. Hey, Jesus, when you come into your earthly kingdom, can we sit at your right and your left hand? Essentially, can we sit in the place of kings? They want greatness and glory, and Jesus answers them, asking them if they want groaning and gloom. They want greatness and glory. Jesus is like, well, actually what I'm offering is groaning and gloom. And then they answer gleefully. They're like, of course, drink that cup. Where is that? I'm going to kill that cup. Give me the cup. Where's the baptism? I need that baptism. And Jesus the whole time knows that they don't know what they're asking for. Now, here's what's interesting. In Jewish rabbinic culture, it would have been popular and prominent for a rabbi when he's walking through town for his most prominent disciple to attend to him on his right hand, his second most prominent disciple to attend to him on his left. So here's the picture. Here's Jesus and the 12 walking from a town. All of a sudden, James and John detach themselves from the rest and just naturally assume positions at Jesus's right hand and at Jesus's left hand. James and John, two thirds of the inner circle. Can you imagine what Peter's thinking as Peter's looking up the line like, what these dudes doing? Then they say, hey, teacher, will you do whatever we ask you to do? Now, let's be honest. None of us in this room are going to answer that question yes. If I walked up to you and I said, will you do whatever I tell you to do? Will you say yes to whatever I'm asking you? I hope your answer is no. So Jesus then says, what do you want? He doesn't answer the question. He answers the question with the question. And he goes on to say, they ask for glory. And he says, well... I don't have glory, but what I have is groaning and gloom. They see themselves as worshiping and venerating their disciple. They see themselves at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. They see themselves asking earnestly for something that matters. And what they don't realize is that this is not discipleship or worship. This is a self-interested request. This is leeching. They're using Jesus to get something they want without actually hearing Jesus to obey his words and commands. And for those of us who spend any considerable amount of time in church, there is a red flag here. We must be mindful of those followers of Jesus who intentionally separate themselves from the rest of the body lift themselves up as more important or more knowledgeable or those who have higher positions of prominence and seek glory for themselves. Those folks, be watchful, be mindful, and watch out for them. Because it is likely that their interests are self-interested rather than others interested. And the reality is, friends, James and John don't even have to do all of this. Jesus promises seats in glory next to him for those who are willing to follow and obey. They're asking for something that Jesus is going to give them anyway. If they're faithful and humble, And the reality is when they say, yes, we can drink the cup and yes, we can be baptized with that baptism, they don't know what they're asking for. 
In the same way that nine-year-old self me didn't know what I was asking for when I asked to eat the pepper from churches growing up. See, we love church's chicken. I love church's chicken growing up. We lived in Birmingham. It was like my favorite chicken. We had Miss Winters. We had Lee's chicken. Uh, we had church's chicken, but I mean, it didn't come close to mama's fried chicken because ain't nothing going to touch that. Not even your fried chicken. I'll fight you over it. But when, when it comes to fried chicken, it was churches and we love churches. Now churches later on, they changed the recipe. It ain't the same chicken. It ain't the same biscuits. Uh, so it, I don't eat at churches no more in the same way that like around 1997, McDonald's changed what they were frying their fries in. So the fries at McDonald's used to be amazing. And now they're just kind of okay. Some of y'all ain't never had a real McDonald's French fry. I feel sad for you, son. Like, <laughs> When I think about the way the food used to be, I'm on ADD, I'm moving off back to churches. So with churches, we'd be sitting there eating dinner and every meal there was a pepper, a pickled jalapeno pepper that came with the meal. And it was kind of a sign of being an adult. So my parents would have it and I'd be like, hey mom, let me have, let me have, let me have the pepper. I want the pepper. She's like, no, you can't eat the pepper. I'm like, why can't I eat the pepper? She said, the pepper's hot, it will light you up. I'm like, try me. She's like, no. And then finally one night she did. She let me try it. She slid and it came in like this little paper sack thing. She slid it over. She just looked at me and I'm like, here we go. Tonight is the night I become a man. <laughs> so I pull this pepper out and I take a big bite out of this pepper and I'm chewing it. And y'all instantly I begin to weep. My nose begins to run. I instantly regret eating the pepper. Why do, I say, why do I say that to you? I say that because sometimes we don't know what we're asking for. James and John think that they're asking for something that is noble and honorific and easy. Sure, it's noble. Sure, it's honorific, but it won't be easy. They're interested in themselves, but what Jesus is interested in, second point this morning, is selfless service rendered for others. A selfless service rendered for others. There's the reality here in the text where cup and baptism refer to something very specific. Now, the temptation is for us to be anachronistic, meaning that we take a contemporary definition and we place it upon an ancient setting. We shouldn't take our own understandings of the Lord's table and baptism, even what we just saw this morning, and download it here onto the text. That's not what it means. Here, cup and baptism carry a similar connotation, which is an ordained thing from God to someone. So Jesus is saying, it, can you drink my cup? Meaning, God has ordained me for something, for a specific purpose. Can you do that? And they're like, yes, we can do that. And in the back of Jesus' mind, I imagine he's thinking, are you willing to give up your life to be brutally flogged, to be killed, to have a spear shoved in your side, to die, and then three days later be raised again? They don't know what they're asking for. In the same way, baptism is an ordained thing from God given to someone else. And Jesus' baptism, his ordained project was to be in and pass through the waters of God's judgment to be raised to the newness of life so that others might successfully make that journey. But ultimately, baptism referred to a ritual ceremonial cleansing. And Jesus is essentially saying that I'm not just gonna cleanse you once so that you gotta keep getting clean. I'm gonna cleanse you once and for all. Baptism means something different to us. It's when I was a kid, I used my, we had uh, penny loafers. Yeah, anybody ever wear penny loafers? Some of y'all got some loafers on right now. I thought that pennies were made for penny loafers. Like I thought pennies, like actual pennies, like their function in life was to go inside of shoes. So I was startled later on to find out that a penny is actually currency that's meant for something else. Baptism in this day was kind of like penny loafers. They thought baptism was ceremonial cleansing, but really baptism in this day was a picture that pointed forward to an ultimate cleansing and righteousness that Jesus would provide because Jesus is concerned about selfless service rendered for others. Now, when I think about selfless service, I want to show you this picture of somebody that this reminds me of. Who, who, can y'all tell me who this is? Maui. I see this picture and I instantly begin to covet his hair. 
My children see pictures of me from 10 or 12 years ago, and I'm like, Dad, you had hair? I'm like, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but Maui, in the movie Moana, is a demigod who, as a young man, had deep insecurities. He had a really rough childhood. So he spent his entire life trying to make other humans happy to fill his own insecurity. So he does things for other people so that it makes him feel good. So in the Samoan myths, he pulls islands up from the ground. He pulls volcanoes up from the ground. He adorns the sky. He does all of these things for humans. And each feat, he's got to get bigger. He's got to get better. He's got to get more elaborate because he's got to hear the praise of Maui. He's so great in order for himself to feel good. Uh, then ultimately, he ends up stealing the heart of Tefiti, and then it casts the entire world into sort of decay. And then a 12-year-old girl shows up, and she's the one who has to save the day. Why do I say that? Because for Maui, everything that Maui did was serving himself. He served for other people because of how it made him feel. But then you've got a 12-year-old girl who stands as the, as the antithesis to Maui, and she, having a desire to wayfare and sail the seas, goes out and she goes to save her people simply because it's the right thing to do. Now, side note, she's 12 years old. She ain't never sailed before. So she hops on this boat, goes out into the ocean. Do y'all know how far those islands in the Pacific are from one another? She's 12. Also, do y'all know what lives in the ocean? Sharks. Man, I've told y'all this before. I don't walk up into a shark's house to like... Like a shark's not walking up in my crib making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich trying to eat. I'm not going in this crib to like hang out and I'm not doing that. But here's a 12 year old for the sake of others, lays her own life down on the line. Jesus is getting at the point that his entire purpose of his entire life is so that others are blessed by his service. It actually will inconvenience him to drink the cup it will be painful to endure that baptism, but this is the type of selfless service that Jesus calls those who desire greatness into. Because true greatness is action on behalf of others and not yourself. A lot of us spend a lot of time platforming ourselves. We can be tempted to sort of make our own names great. And in the kingdom of God, greatness is the result of one being brought low. And the truth is that what we see in the text is that greatness really can't be achieved individually in the kingdom of God. Greatness has to be achieved together. And in order to achieve greatness, third and finally, we have to see that service together is greatness. Now, I want you to look at something really interesting with me in verse 41. Look in verse 41. In verse 41, when the 10 heard it, they began to become indignant. Now, uh, everybody in here, we've been mad at one point in time, but like, have you ever been like steaming mad? Like I'm talking about so angry, like you just, like it's hard for you to contain your words. You're so mad, like you start turning colors, right? Now, I don't turn colors. Shouts out to all the Melanated folks. But some of my friends, like, turn colors. I saw a man one time turn purple. He was so angry, right? You, you've been so mad, you really just wanted to punch somebody in the throat. Please don't punch nobody in the throat. Violence is not the answer. But some of us get so angry. The honest expression of our heart is, I need you to go away. So here are the 10. Walking behind Jesus, John, and James, Jesus' answer tips them off in a way that either he's talking loudly or they can deduce from the subject matter about what they're speaking about as Jesus begins to talk about the cup and baptism. And then they get angry and then watch what Jesus does in verse 42. In verse 42, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, you've got a separate group. You've got two men who intentionally separated themselves to attain and seek glory and greatness. You've got 10 others who are left behind and Jesus brings them together to speak to them together. There's a message here that essentially says that you can't actually achieve what you want and need to achieve separate from one another. In order to submit this point, I just need to talk a little bit about what greatness actually looks like. I wanna show you, I wanna show y'all what greatness looks like. Y'all wanna see what greatness looks like? This is what greatness looks like. 
Y'all, that's greatness. Greatness ain't Jafar. Greatness ain't Maui. Greatness is Emily, the cashier at Chick-fil-A, who has an idea of other-centered service and hospitality that makes every single one of us that go to Chick-fil-A crave to go back. Why? Because it's their pleasure. (laughs) I I, I made this this statement in the first service, and I don't believe I'm being hyperbolic about it at all, but Chick-fil-A is to the hospitality industry. You can even insert Disney into the hospitality industry what Apple was to cell phones. They've reoriented the entire model of how they think about engaging customers by saying our service is a pleasure for us. Jesus tells his disciples that greatness is the result when y'all get together, when y'all serve together, that's greatness. Now this would have been very countercultural because there were two realities that would have made James and John do what they did. The Greek influence throughout, the, throughout this land was really prominent and in Greek philosophy and in Greek culture, it was thought that the lowest person on the social total pole or hierarchy was a servant or a slave, meaning the worst thing that you could ever do is to be a servant. One common question of the day was this, how can a man be happy when he has to serve someone? Essentially, our entire lives are surrounded and filled with the idea that we are served. So James and John go to Jesus with that same mentality. They're like, yo, when you get off to glory, let us sit at your right hand and your left hand. We want to be those who are served. Jesus says these things are not to be so in the kingdom of God. So Jesus brings them together because I want y'all to hear me when I say this. We do silly things when we're in isolation. So Jesus brings them together because we do crazy things when we're isolated. So he brings them together because we believe lies when we're isolated. He brings them together into the community and he says, this is not the way of my followers. But if you want to be great, then you need to be a servant. And he says that a greatness is not the, you don't bully people to be great. You don't exercise authority like those over the Gentiles do, but you serve. Now, this is incredibly countercultural. It's incredibly countercultural. But when I think about the greatest people that I know, the folks who walk with Jesus so closely, those who love God so much, there is one central commonality in all of them. It is that they have made a humble resolve to give their lives away. I like the way that James Edwards says this in his commentary in the book of Mark. He says the reason why a servant is the most preeminent position in the kingdom of God is that the sole function of a servant is to give. And giving is the essence of God. For us this morning, serving together is important for two practical reasons. One, it's fun and joyful to serve with one another. Some of the most fun people, some of the most joyful people I see in the morning are the folks at the front door cutting up. Like y'all greeters, y'all have too much fun in the mornings. Like sometimes I want to be like, I just need to borrow some of that because I come in, it's been a hard week. And then I see them and I'm like, goodness gracious, joy is infectious. When you serve with people and students or you serve with people and children's or you serve with folks in worship or on the safety team, there's a joy that's there. But also when we serve together, we get to aid one another and help one another avoid burning out on serving so that someone's not serving in the same position for years on end without a break. But when we're all together, when it's all hands on deck, We are exercising what it looks like to be like Jesus, but we're also experiencing the joy of Jesus. And we can't miss what Jesus says in verse 45, the very reason why he's come. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. I've I've said this before, like y'all, if I'm God, if I'm God, I'm coming to earth and I need y'all to carry me on a chase everywhere I go. I need the grapes ready for me to eat. 
I need everyone shouting and chanting my name. I need there to be pyrotechnics in the sky. I need people bending over to worship. But Jesus comes in the inconspicuous way of poverty by way of a manger. God in flesh delays his ministry in some ways until 30. And in just three years, brings the kingdom of God, it erupts across the world, changes the world so that you and I are sitting here today because of the way this man lived. If even Christ Jesus himself, who the prologue of John and even in Colossians 1 tell us that all things were created by him and for him and through him, all things, he is the purpose and the medium and the end of all creation. He came not to be served, but to serve. Next week, uh, William and Pastor William and Pastor Matt are going to begin teaching through the book of Philippians. And how does Paul describe the person and work of Christ Jesus other than though he himself was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Taking on the form of a what? Servant. And Paul even goes so far as to say that the Taking on the role of a servant is actually what leads to verses 8 and 9, which is the exaltation. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Paul uses, I'm still in their thunder. I'm sorry, fellas. It's so good to me. I got to say it. Paul actually invents a phrase to talk about the exaltation of Jesus. He combines two phrases that literally mean that God has superabounded exalted him above every name that is named so that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. And he got to greatness because he was willing to serve. Here's the whole point of this sermon. I'm two minutes over. I'm done after this. AKA, I got seven more minutes. I'm kidding. <laughs> but for real, but for real. Here's the whole point of the sermon. Thinking about the failure of worship, the failure of discipleship, thinking about selfless service, thinking about greatness together, your worship of God without serving others is incomplete and insincere. We can't say that we are worshiping God if we aren't serving other people, which is why God made us. If it is fundamentally Christ-like to give your life away, to serve others, then it means that we should be serious about doing that here in the context of this church. Now, here's what this means for us. We're about to enter into a season where it's about to be all hands on deck. We are hitting post-COVID highs in children, and August isn't here yet. We are hitting incredibly busy seasons, and folks are going to be kind of in and out, but we're entering a season where we need everyone. We need all hands in, all hands on deck, because as my dad used to always say, many hands make light work. And for those who have served this church in the past, are serving currently, praise God for you. For those who have yet to commit to hop in somewhere to serve, we've got incredible needs when it comes to our children. We've got incredible needs when it comes to our students. And listen, I don't know a better way to give your life away than to creating space for a middle school or a high school student to just talk and process and be. And you're not, you don't have to didact to them. You don't have to teach to them. You don't have to tell them what to do, but create the space to listen because they are this church now and for tomorrow. What better way to multiply ourselves and to invest in the future of our church than to spend time there? So I'm done. I'm done. I got nothing else to say. But I believe that every time God's word is open, it demands a response. And I don't know what the spirit of God is doing in and through you, but maybe he's leading you in a particular way. Let's just take the next 30 seconds to hear from the Spirit of God what it is that he might be speaking to us, how he might be leading us. Let's take the next 30 seconds to hear and to obey what it is that Christ by the Spirit is inviting us into. So let's pray.
Father in heaven, I thank you that you have sent your son to do what we cannot. That you have sent your son to not only take our place, it's home for the sin of the world, but to serve us in such a way that it transforms and changes us. So Father, would you create in us hearts that would desire to serve? Hearts that would be focused on a selfless service for others? And create in us a desire as a church to be great, not by our numbers, not by our budget, but Father, let us see greatness as the product when we throw our hands in together, we pitch in to do the work you've called us to do. Make us those people. And as we consider the work that you've done on our behalf, would it be a response of praise and worship because of how great you have been and are to us. Lord, we love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people say it. Amen. I want to invite you this morning to stand as we sing in response to God's word, lifting up the greatness of who God is and his faithfulness.
Nothing in our hands do we bring, simply to the cross do we cling. For you are great, and your name is greatly to be praised. Father, take our worship, may be a blessing to you and to these people. Amen. Two things before we go. One, if you're a guest here with us this morning, thank you for being here. We are grateful you're here. I'm going to be out here in Connection Point before we go, um, and I would love to get a chance to meet you. I just remembered I didn't tell the truth. I got three things, not two. The second thing is if you signed up and registered for breakfast, please head down and eat. If you did not register, like wait 30 minutes and then go see if there's some leftovers, but don't go down there right now, okay? Uh, volunteer breakfast this morning is just for those who register. Please go eat. We're going to be down there with you. And the third thing is we have some volunteers back here in our prayer room who would love the opportunity to meet you where you are, to pray with you, to encourage you, whatever is happening in your world right now. So I want to commend them to you. If there's something that's going on or maybe uh, you just need to vent or talk to somebody or maybe you would like sp prayer for something specific, they would be thrilled to welcome you here this morning. As we go, I pray that the words of Matthew 10, 45 would be etched in and on our hearts and our minds, that you and I would take it to heart that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So go and give your life away in Jesus' name. Have an incredible week. We love you. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to find out more about what a life following Jesus could look like, we'd love to help you with that. Be sure to fill out a connect card at fellowshiproswell.org slash today and someone from the church will be in touch with you. If you have a prayer request or other need, be sure to visit our care page at fellowshiproswell.org slash care. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you have a great week.